This is an ordinary man. He is shy, awkward, doesn't smile a lot, terrible with women, curious, determined and innovative. He is a railroad engineer, a newsreel cameraman, a college student, a tourist, a sailor. He is, of course, Joseph Frank Keaton, better known as Buster. Born October 4th, 1895 to two travellers, Joe and Myra Keaton, in a village called Pequa in Kansas. His parents were travelling actors, part of the vaudeville movement, who also sold medicine on the side. They travelled with the famous musician and escape artist, Harry Houdini. Vaudeville was a curious pastime for Americans in Europe of the late 1800s and early 1900s. Twice a day, performers would go on stage to perform slapstick comedy for an audience. It was rude, rough, dangerous, morally repugnant, and it was a hit across the United States. At age four, Keaton began performing alongside his parents. He would be thrown around the stage by his father, trampled on, and kicked into the audience for laughs. At one point, Keaton broke his neck after falling into the audience and was not aware of the injury until several years later. He was locked in a suitcase and almost suffocated. He had part of his finger amputated, survived several train wrecks, three hotel fires, and was even sucked out of a window by a tornado being deposited several streets away. Those weren't part of the act, by the way. Those, those actually happened to him. After one particularly bad fall involving a flight of stairs, Harry Houdini gave Joseph the nickname Buster, and it stuck for the rest of his life. The police, of course, had to do something about this blatant violence against a child, but it all was overlooked after his parents explained that Buster was, in fact, a fully grown man with dwarfism. By age five, Buster did his own makeup. By age nine, Buster was in charge of booking the family hotel rooms while traveling. By age 11, Buster wrote scripts for routines to do with his family. He spent just one day of his life in school. During a break from traveling in his early teens, Keaton took up professional acting on the stage, where he met Roscoe Arbuckle, a silent film actor and director who had been in the movie industry for a while as part of the Keystone Cops comedy group. Nobody, not even Keaton or his family, thought that movies would be anything more than a novelty item to be displayed in shops. His father even exclaimed that nobody is going to put the Keatons on a bedsheet for 10 cents a throw. While initially skeptical of the medium, Buster eventually came around, becoming not only an actor, but Arbuckle's chief joke writer. However, after producing 12 two-reel films for Arbuckle, Keaton was drafted into the US military to fight in the First World War. He was assigned to the 40th Division of the US Army, and following a brief period of training, Keaton was shipped to France, where he had to endure the horrible conditions of the trenches. An ear infection caused by sleeping in a dirty tent left him permanently deaf in one ear. What made it worse was by the time he got there, the war was basically over anyway, and didn't really need to take time out of his life to do service. Buster would call his service a career at the rear. On April 29th, 1919, Buster was discharged from the military and was back on the silver screen in 1920 with The Saphead, Buster's first feature film role. He was eventually given a personal production unit, the Buster Keaton unit, and from there began to make his own pictures with himself as the director, producer, and lead actor. Lucky for Keaton, and the medium of cinema as a whole, the Western world was about to embark on a decade of unparalleled prosperity. People had more free time than ever, which means more time to go to the movies, more money for Keaton, and then more films that could be made. Keaton's films have a very distinct style, most noticeably his use of slapstick and body language. Keaton was also an opponent of title cards, and preferred to tell his story through visual gags instead of dialogue. The average picture used 240 titles, that was about the average. And the most I ever used was 56. You can't tell exactly what these two are saying, but you can guess he's fumbling over his words in embarrassment. Like during Vaudeville, Keaton also did his own stunts, even if they were extremely dangerous. Keaton told his cameraman, keep filming until he yells cut, or is killed. This shot was real, and this one, and this one, and this one. In this shot, Keaton was warned that if the train suffered wheel spin, he would be killed instantly, 
and he still did it anyway. In this shot, the force of the water made Keaton break his neck, but he still stood up and continued the take. There were no stunt doubles, there were no special effects, every injury is 100% real. Lastly is his method of acting. While acting on stage as a child, Keaton would often get caught up in the humour and laugh, which he noticed often killed the joke for the audience. However, if he kept silent, the audience would laugh more. This carried over to his cinematic work too, and in nearly every shot of every movie he made, Keaton never smiled. He was known in the acting world as the Great Stone Face, and the audience loved him for it. On top of his head was always a flat pork pie hat, which Keaton made personally by converting a fedora into the design. He said he produced over a thousand of these in his lifetime. He would rarely script his films, coming up with only a beginning and an end, and making up the scenes and jokes as he went along. It was on the sets of Hollywood where Keaton met Natalie Talmadge, another silent movie star and eventually his wife. Continuing the family trend, they named their first son Joseph. Their second son they named Robert. Buster had his own luxury home built in Beverly Hills, which still exists today and is owned by an advertising magnate. Keaton was at the top of his game. Nice wife, nice kids, nice mansion, $200,000 a year in salary. Not bad for a 30 year old. In 1926, Buster set out to make his masterpiece, a comedy drama set in the Civil War, The General. Based on a real life event, Keaton played a Confederate railroad engineer who sets out to rescue his lover from being kidnapped by the Union. Filming took place in the small town of Cottage Grove, Oregon, and for his magnum opus, Keaton spared no expense. He bought two entire vintage trains and 18 freight cars of Civil War antiques. The entire Oregon State Guard was rented out to play both the Confederate and Union soldiers. 3,000 people were working on the film, which was said to cost $400 an hour. When his creative team was stuck for ideas, the whole crew would take hours off to play baseball. Bridges and dams were built to artificially lower or raise the tide of rivers, getting perfect levels for the camera. Fires were accidentally started, causing production to stop and lawsuits be paid out. Keaton was knocked unconscious doing a stunt with a cannon. It all accumulated in this the most expensive shot in silent cinema history. The wreck of the train was left in the river until it was salvaged for scrap in the Second World War. In all, over six kilometers of film had been used to make the picture and took several months to edit properly. Buster called it the best film he ever made. The New York Herald Tribune called it the least funny thing he's ever done. On a budget of three quarters of a million dollars, it barely made back a half at the box office. Today, critics recognize the general as one of the greatest films of all time, but in the 1920s, the film was critically and financially a failure. It lost Buster his independence as a filmmaker, and his production company, United Artists, told him that he would have to have a production manager to monitor and control every film he made to ensure the story and production would remain as cheap as possible. He went on to make College and Steamboat Bill Jr. under this changed contract, although both of these weren't very financially successful. Down on his luck, Buster moved studios to Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producing two more films himself. The Cameraman and Spite Marriage. Although the films were successful, Buster called the switch the worst mistake of his life. MGM was a deadly serious business venture instead of an artistic venture like United Artists. While Keaton was interested in making movies with sound, MGM forced him to make his scripts silent to save money, leading to pictures with many title cards. He would also be forced to use stunt doubles, another blow to his signature style. Into the 1930s, Keaton descended into alcoholism. His wife, kids, house, money, and job vanished in his downward spiral. The only thing he had for certain was a bottle of whiskey a day. He was briefly interred in a mental hospital, and then married another woman while drunk. He divorced her too, and lost most of his money in the process. His sons changed their names to avoid connections with him. In his autobiography, he stated that the films he made in the 30s were among the worst things he ever created. In the mental institution, 
Buster met Eleanor Norris, who helped nurse him out of his alcoholism. He went on to marry her despite her being 23 years younger. He also reunited with his children, both of them now fully grown adults. They remained a part of his life until his death. Despite getting his life on track, Buster was approaching his 50s and couldn't continue with the hectic life of being a director, producer and lead actor. He instead worked only as an actor in television and short films, earning less than 10% of his previous salary. He appeared in the Twilight Zone and sketch comedy programming. In the 1950s, he did advertising work, made cameo roles in unfunny Mexican movies, and even appeared on I've Got a Secret. In the 1960s, Keaton helped produce several short films, including a silent travelogue for the National Film Board of Canada, entitled The Rail Rodder. His final film role was in the 1966 film A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, where a 70-year-old Keaton still did the dangerous stunts he performed in his youth. Despite being physically and mentally fit, in January of 1966, Keaton was diagnosed with severe lung cancer, but was never told of his condition. He thought it was just part of his recurring bronchitis. A month later, on the 1st of February 1966, Keaton died. He was physically active and content with life right up until his final day. Buster Keaton, having never been to school, having held nearly no other jobs, had quite literally devoted his entire life to the art of entertaining people. So next time you're stuck in on a Friday night and you've watched everything on Netflix, why not put on a classic Buster Keaton film? You might be surprised how entertaining they are. The man behind them knows exactly what he is doing. Stars above, and you make love. I'll 